Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and today we are on to pseudoscientist number six for the 12 pseudoscientists of Christmas, which means that we're halfway through. So before we jump in, why don't we check on today's pseudoscientist, see what he's up to. Hey Del, what are you doing over there? Move. Can you move please? Please move. Pretty please. Pretty please with a cherry on top. Uh, Del, are you okay? Ooh, move. Ooh, move. Hey Del, I want to talk to you about something. Could you stop for a second, maybe? Okay. So Del, do you want to maybe give us an overview of what your argument is going to be like today? Magic woo-woo fairy dust. Really? I mean, surely it is better than that, right? No. Are you just saying that because you've decided to debunk flat earthers in this video? I've had one conversation with the guru known as Eric Dubai, who wants to spew pseudoscience gibberish. That's not really what I asked about, but okay. Now the people who want to avoid the earth being the thing that's in motion, these are the people who are coming up with all sorts of gibberish. Del, that wasn't your cue to say anything. Can you please let me- No. But you didn't let me finish. We'll just jump into it. Now, force and energy are words to describe motion. Okay, so we'll start with motion. Motion simply is, you know, we've got an object at rest, okay? Um, and it wants to remain at rest, blah, 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 right? Now, what we require is we require force, which is just something else that's in motion to apply a pressure to something else that puts it in motion, right? So a force doesn't necessarily have to come from something in motion, and it doesn't necessarily have to put something else in motion. A good example of this is if I push my hands together. Both of my hands here are applying a force on each other, but they're not moving as a result of that force. This is because if you add the forces together, you get a net force of zero. Now, if I remove one of my hands, then all of a sudden the other hand moves. By the way, it's worth mentioning that when we're talking about motion in relation to force, it refers specifically to acceleration, not just to general motion. So we can say that a certain amount of force is required to move that object, you know, 30 centimeters. Well, uh, not really. We can say that a certain amount of force is required to get something up to a certain speed or a certain velocity, but we can't say exactly how far that will travel based on the amount of force that we apply to it, because we don't know the friction conditions or the air resistance. If we did know that, then we can say how far it would travel. All we really have in reality is motion. Force and energy are concepts to try and explain motion. Well, here's the thing, Del. Motion is just a concept as well, because all it is is it's just a change in position over time. Now that's not to say that it's useless or anything, it is a very useful concept, but it is still a concept nonetheless. Well, if you go to a childlike, you know, explanation that will say a force is, can be intuitively described as a push or a pull. Using push and pull to describe forces is really bad actually, because all forces do is change the direction that something is going in. Push and pull is irrelevant to it. There is no energy. When I when I push this, I don't impart some mystical, magical woo-woo onto this thing. It gains nothing, it loses nothing. When you push it, it gains kinetic energy. It moves. That is kinetic energy, something moving. Again, energy are concepts to explain the amount of motion. We can take something like fuel, right? And people describe this as, as potential energy has the potential to achieve work or motion, okay? But the fuel in itself doesn't, doesn't contain energy or force or any of these things. Again, like if I put fuel into an internal combustion engine and ignite it, we get an expansion that happens, we have a motion that happens that, that then has a knock-on effect that creates other motion. But Del, something that needs to be considered here is the proportionality of things. If I try to push a car with the same amount of effort that it takes to turn a key, I'm not going to get very far. At the end of the day, we're getting a lot more motion from a simple key turn than if I were to try to apply that motion somewhere else. There is something else there that has to be causing that motion. We call this something else potential energy, which is a useful concept to explain why just turning a key can cause a lot more motion. Motion is caused by the mechanism of push. In order for something to move, you need to push it. 
That's not really true. Sometimes you've got things that absorb light, and when it absorbs light, it will heat up or something, which is a type of motion. It's not really being pushed there. So people talk about force and energy, are talking about conceptual language that's trying to describe motion. So people talking about motion are talking about conceptual language to try and describe a change in position. Things like tension. If I apply pressure to both parts of this and I expand it out, people will say, oh, it has a potential energy now. No, I'm taking it out of its equilibrium, right? Which is a, a tension. Yeah, but my question is, if there's only push and that's the only thing that exists, why would that even stay together? Why wouldn't it just go, okay, we don't have to stay together, we're just gonna move apart. If there's only push, then at the atomic level, there's no reason for two atoms to stay together. They can just bugger off if they want. And again, it can be useful, because if I know how much pressure I need to apply in order to move that thing over a certain distance, then I can write that down. I mean, I do agree with Dell here that a lot of concepts can be useful, and there's a surprising number of things that we might think is just something concrete that Really, when you boil it down, it's just a concept, like the concept of push, for example. Now, if I was to hold this here and I was to let it go, right, people are, are, are invoking that this thing moves through space. Right, when I let that go, it's being claimed that this moves through space. So this is being claimed to accelerate, to move motion. What have we established? If somebody claims motion happens, we need something that pushes on it, right? Well, it depends on what you use here. If you use Newtonian gravity, well, when you let it go, it's going to move towards the Earth because of the mass of the Earth. However, if we use Einstein's space-time, then we can treat it as if it is being stationary. Under that, the curvature of space-time causes the direction of the object to shift from space to time. But to the object, it's just traveling in a straight line through space and time. And if that sounds weird to you, well, relativity is confusing and complicated. It can be quite difficult to explain it in a way that makes sense to everybody. No such thing as pull. Only push. Pressure makes stuff move. So, if this was to be accelerated in any direction... Um... Uh, Del, you might want to stop that before I censor it. Okay, it might be a good thing to like let Del do his thing and we'll just skip ahead 30 seconds. If I accelerate it in that direction, the liquid moves to the back and the air towards the direction of acceleration. So here, if somebody's going to claim this accelerates downwards, then this moves to the top and the air should move to the bottom. That's what happens in the case of acceleration. But people don't want that. They want to try and come up with woo-woo, globe-type, nonsensical gibberish. Okay, Del, the problem that you're running into here is you're not considering what a uniform distribution of acceleration downwards would do. A uniform distribution of acceleration would accelerate everything down at the same rate, so things in the bottle wouldn't go to the top suddenly. Sure, if we've got something like relative density disequilibrium, well, that doesn't fit what we see in reality. However, a uniform acceleration does. Now we have people saying, well, the, the, the object should rest, and you apply a force, which is correct, because I have to apply pressure, I have to squeeze it, right? Then I have to put my arm in motion in order to elevate it to here, and then they say, when you done that, you gave this potential energy. Whatever the fuck that means. Well, what that means is that if it has no forces acting upon it, it would have kinetic energy making it go downwards. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, so it has to get that energy from somewhere, so we say that it has gravitational potential energy. Now, I'm not entirely sure how this works in relativity, because I do know that in that... E equals mc squared, but the mc squared is squared, and it's actually e squared equals mc squared squared plus momentum times c squared? I'm not sure. I'm, uh, it's been a long time since I've looked at that. But then there's the relativity aspect to it, so things change depending on your reference frame. My point is that if you just use classical physics, it may not work 100% well, but things become a lot simpler then. It's just the same as me sitting at the end saying, right, 
Right, I've touched you now. I've touched you. I've gave you potential. Now move. Move. Can you move, please? Please move. Pretty please. Pretty please with a cherry on top. Dell does realise that RC cars exist, right? Basically, you charge it up, which gives it potential energy, and then you use a remote control to make it move, which converts that potential energy into kinetic energy. That is a thing. You know, several hundred years ago, if people had brought that idea up, people might have considered it woo woo magic fairy dust. Right, I've moved it. I've given it more potential energy. Can you move back, please? You did give it more energy by moving it, but that energy was lost to heat and sound, which I guess are both forms of kinetic energy, really. So, again, it's the same. If you're going to claim that the car, the car is a thing that accelerated itself, how is that, how does that make itself move? Huh? Saying it's, it's more dense than the air and the air can't support it and blah blah blah. Right, well, the density of the air here is the same as the density of the air here, here and here, but it still goes that way. Doesn't it go that way? Doesn't it go up the way? Doesn't it go in any other direction? It goes down the way. So in case anyone missed it, that is an anti-flat earth argument. I hear that argument used all the time against flat earthers, particularly against flat earthers that say, oh, things go down because of the pressure of the air around it. But here's the thing, he is trying to debunk flat earthers here. This isn't a flat earther making a mistake. He's argued with flat earthers about this for quite a while now. But remember, this, the table, the floor, myself, we're all connected to the reference frame. And if, and if it's the reference frame that's pushing towards our feet, that's what creates the upward vector and gives you the equal and opposite downward vector. Oh geez, we've got Mitchell from Australia levels of misunderstanding of reference frames. Nothing's connected to a reference frame. Reference frames don't actually exist. They're a concept. Please remember that, Dell. But here's the thing, I genuinely think that Dell could probably grasp that kind of concept. Also, here's a fun fact. The idea of reference frames makes the idea of motion even more of a concept than it was before. Because here's the thing, if you've got an inertial reference frame, and let's say it's based on a train that's going 80 kilometers per hour, then things like the mountains, they are moving. They are in motion relative to the reference frame. All motion is relative to a reference frame and you can base a reference frame on anything. And you know, I think that Dell might even agree with that. I've got people saying, oh, well it moved, uh, and the reason it moved is because you removed the, the, the brake. Well, me removing the brake's not imparting any pressure on this, right? I'm not applying a force. I'm just simply removing the block. But if there is a uniform force on that car, then the car is going to move downwards after you remove the force that is keeping that car in place, acting against the force that is acting upon that car. It'd be like if I had a really big magnet over here and a smaller magnet over here, and I had my hand stopping that magnet from going to this magnet. If I release my hand, then that magnet is going to go over to that magnet. I'm not being accelerated towards the magnet that I'm stopping, I'm just applying a force that is acting in opposition to it. Buoyancy and density, the effect of, you know, something sinking through a medium, or air bubbles rising through the medium, they stop the minute that I let the thing go. Right? Because density and buoyancy do not create themselves. Things have a set density, and you have things that are buoyant, like air bubbles and whatever, but the motion of those in that vector are only there when it's connected to the reference frame. Alright, I generally agree with Dell here. He's getting things right. You're on a roll, Dell. Keep it up. The only thing that I would say is that I don't really like him saying when it's connected to the reference frame, that's when buoyancy exists. A better way of phrasing that is buoyancy does not exist in freefall. I'm 99.99% .99 sure that is what he is trying to say. And yeah, I agree. He's right here. Turns out that arguing against flat earthers is an easy way to be correct, even if you're a flat earther. The thing that I disagree with him on is he arrives at the conclusion that Earth is a flat disk accelerating upwards at 9.81 meters per second squared. Well, that and some of the interpretations that he has about physics. I am genuinely curious though what Dell would say if he saw this, because I have made fun of him a little bit, cracked a few jokes, but I mean, 
I don't think he's the type to get offended by that. I mean, one of the jokes was just repackaging something that he did that I found quite funny. However, I can't be too kind to Dell here because there is something that he did say later on. So let's skip ahead to that. I'm gonna show you the magnets. You know, back to the push-pull thing. When we look at magnetism, right, again, this has nothing to do with the cause of the directional vector or density and buoyancy, but people keep invoking this stuff. Okay, I agree with him on what he's saying about the flat earth stuff like buoyancy. However, I don't like the old push-pull thing. It's not a good way to describe forces. Right, particularly when I'm talking about how there's no pull, right? Well, people say, but that goes towards that, so there is a pulling force. No, that relative to that going towards it is how we describe you know, pull is used to describe that. The mechanism of the motion is always something pushing. So when I look at magnetism, we've got a flow that goes on, right? A continual flow, right? And when that comes out of the vicinity of that flow, we see the motion. Okay, so he's describing magnetism as a flow of some mysterious substance. Now, we can't see the substance. We've just got to assume that it is there and that it is flowing. There is a problem with this though, because if the flow of this mysterious substance is pushing magnets together, that only works in one direction. Because magnets have both a north pole and a south pole, and both of these poles seem to attract things towards them. That doesn't work if things are being pushed towards them. So yeah, there is a bit of faulty reasoning when it comes to Dell, but hey, I don't mind him debunking flat earthers, he can continue to do that all he wants. So yeah, we'll leave Dell here so that he can play with his spray bottle or whatever it is that he does off camera. I said off camera, Dell, I haven't finished the video yet. Anyway, seeing as I am ending the video here. That wasn't your cue, Dell. Anyway, leave a like and subscribe if you like this video. Leave a comment letting me know who you think is going to show up in the next videos. As always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons. Hugh Jars, MC Nutkin, Mori, Vermont1777, Tony C, Rosanna Keller, Wolfie, Kid Vicious, Sarge Campbell, definitely not NASA, Craig D'Amelio, Richard M. Chapman, Kaylee, and Fizz Wizard. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. There should be a link there. Or you could buy me a coffee. I will see you in the next video. Between you and me... Dell, I said not to do that yet!